Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Namaste. Uh, welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next eh, half hour, I'm going to be talking about things that I think you know, uh, should know about and should care about. And a reaction to the show should be sent to me directly. The email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, uh, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there. Uh, as always, um, I would ask that if you send me email, please include something in the subject line, like, you know, left side of the aisle of your cable show, something so I know it's not spam. And uh, if also you would give me a little time for a response. I'm a little slow about answering email, but I do answer. You will get a reply. All right, with that, we're going to get going. I'm going to start off, as I like to, with some good news, or at least this is something I'm calling good news. Uh, a new bill uh, relating to abortion has been introduced into both the House and the Senate. Now, why is that good news, considering the recent history? Well, because the bill... It's called the Women's Health Protection Act of 2013, actually aims to strengthen women's reproductive rights rather than take them away. It is, in short, that rarest of all creatures, a pro-choice bill. The thing is, over the past 17 years, over the past few years, rather, 17 states have passed laws that have uh, had the purpose of restricting access to abortions. Attempts to pass such laws were made in 18 more. Now, these laws are pushed under the smirking lie that they're all about protecting women's health. But the invariable result of these, uh, of these laws is to make it ever harder for women to actually obtain a safe legal medical procedure. The fact is, is that unable to get abortions banned outright, the anti-choice, anti-personal freedom front has uh, settled for now for making them almost impossible to get. Meanwhile, for the moment, the Supreme Court seems content to let the states, state legislatures dominated by right-wingers and lower courts to deal with the issue. Uh, recently, it rejected a challenge to a court decision uh, in Oklahoma blocking part of that state's new restrictive anti-abortion law, then followed it up by also rejecting a challenge to, uh, from a different court uh, relating to Texas's new, even stricter, anti-abortion law, one which is actually resulting in about uh, oh, already dozens of clinics are being forced to close in the state because of this law. Well, the Women's Health Protection Act is a response to that trend. The bill would, in essence, require any state that passes these laws under the claim that they are protecting women's health to show that they actually do. It um, also bans outright certain procedures like legally required ultrasounds and also bans the use of what are called targeted regulation of abortion providers with the appropriate uh, acronym TRAP laws. Uh, what these laws do is replace requirements on abortion providers which are not required of providers of what the bill calls medically comparable procedures. Now, if this bill were to pass, it would be the first pro-choice legislation coming out of Congress since 1994. And even that, that was the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act. And even that was passed as the result of a string of attacks on clinics, including some fire bombings. I should tell you that the prime mover behind this legislation is Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut. He was joined by two colleagues in the Senate and three colleagues in the House. Uh, all six of these people, uh, not surprisingly, are Democrats. But other than Blumenthal, the other five, unfortunately, are all women. Which is unfortunate because, guys, where are you? Unfortunately, the greater unfortunately is that while the bill has fair chances in the Senate, its chances of passing in the right-wing dominated House are realistically none. Um, even Blumenthal admits as much. So, uh, so the point is why, despite that, despite why that certain failure, why do I still say this is good news? Well, two reasons. One, Blumenthal predicts the candidates for Congress next year will actually have to declare their position on this bill, which, if that works out, will make it harder to dodge the issue and harder to hide the fact, as I 
was talking last week and uh, talking about the attacks on the commons. Hard to hide the fact that this is a coordinated nationwide attack, not a series of separate, independent, uh, individual state fights that just by the purest of coincidences all happening to be happening at the same time. But here's the real reason this is good news. It's pushback. Because after years of playing defense, after years of fighting rear guard actions, after years of actions that were aimed not at improving things, but just at preventing them from getting worse, at least some of the Democrats have finally realized that that's not enough. Not on this, not on anything. Now, I actually don't expect the Democrats to anytime soon develop a spine stiffer than a rope. But at least a few of them may be starting to realize that spending all your time in a defensive crouch does not win political matches any more than it wins boxing matches. All right, moving on from there, I, I actually have, uh, and it is sort of related, I have some, mm, let's call them sort of random disjointed comments on all of the recent brouhaha about the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare. Uh, the first of which actually sort of relates to what I was just talking about, which is about women's health and pregnancy. Because I find it amusing, not surprising of course, but amusing, that the same sort of people who are so dead set abortion, the same set of people who will screech to the skies about their, about their concern for unborn children, and by the way, I say again, as I will say over and over, there is no such thing as an unborn child. A fetus is no more an unborn child than a caterpillar is an unborn butterfly. But, in any event, the thing is these people will screech to the heavens their concerns for the unborn children and for the health of pregnant women. These are also the same people who are dead set against government assistance for maternity and, pre and newborn care. As a result, they are now tying themselves into philosophical and rhetorical knots, trying to justify their outrage, their outrage, I tell you, over the fact that Obamacare requires basic insurance policies to cover those services. For example, Representative Renee Elmers, the, who chairs the House GOP Women's Policy Committee, asked Health and Human Services Secretary Catherine Sebelius, has a man ever delivered a baby? The appropriate answer to which is, no, has a woman ever had prostate cancer? I mean, if, it's, if we're not going to cover the one because it's somehow unfair to men to pay for services they'll never use, why should we continue to cover the other? Here's another one. Greg Mankiw, who chaired President Shrub's Council of Economic Advisors, argued that, quoting him, but having children is more choice than a random act of nature. People who drive a new Porsche play, uh, pay more for car insurance than those who drive an old Chevy. We consider that fair because which car you drive is a choice. Why isn't having children viewed the same way? Now, beyond the fact that calling having children a choice allows for both birth control, which yes, some on the right are against, uh, and abortions, and beyond the creepy comparison of having a child with buying a car, I frankly wonder what sort of women Mankiw thinks are having Porsche pregnancies and which ones are having old Chevy pregnancies. Although I actually think we can make a pretty good guess. All right, the, the next thing I wanted to mention, uh, about, it's about the wave of policy cancellations across the country. And the fact is, they are driven by the same thing that has driven the cost of medical insurance for decades now. The desire of the insurance industry to maximize its profits at the expense of the health of its policyholders and of the general public. The purpose is to dump their most expensive customers, the ones who use the most medical services, onto the public rolls, letting the taxpayers pick up the bill, while keeping only those customers they think are the least likely to use the services which the insurance companies are, are selling. Now, they used to accomplish this with pre-existing conditions and rescissions, but they can't do that anymore because it's illegal. So they have come up with new ways, such as trying to force their more expensive consumers either into more expensive plans or onto the exchanges. Exchanges where several of the largest insurance companies have refused to take part. In fact, in 23 states plus the District of Columbia, there are fewer than four companies in the public exchange. 
it's all just more ways to avoid having to cover people who might actually use their, their, their insurance. It's the same game, but the rules have changed, so so have their tactics. And the thing is, we all should have seen this coming. Why would anybody imagine this was not going to happen, that they were not going to try every way they could to continue to maintain their huge profits? I mean, I'm not surprised by um, corporations trying to game the system to their own benefit for their own profit. It's what they do. What I am surprised at is the surprise. Didn't any of these people hear the, t hear the tale of the scorpion and the turtle? All right, but speaking of those cancellations, uh, rather than caving, this is what I wish our prez, the amazing Mr. O, had said about the business of, if you like your plan, you can keep it. Okay, this is what I, I, I would have loved to have had him said, something like this. Yes, I said that, and yes, I meant it. Because it didn't occur to me that someone paying for insurance that, that essentially covers little of anything while sticking them with high, high, uh, sky-high deductibles for what it does cover would rather keep that plan than take advantage of the opportunity to get an affordable plan that actually covers them for health and medical services they actually use. The only reasons people have one of those plans is either that it's cheap, so it's the only thing they can afford, or because of being rejected from other insurance because of pre-existing conditions, it was the only kind of insurance they could get. As a result of the Affordable Care Act, those people can do better for themselves, and I admit it, it just didn't occur to me that any significant number of people might not want to do that. It's like someone with a 65 Nova being told of a program by which they could afford a 2010 Camry and no, no sarcastic remarks about the fact I didn't use an American car, it's just for the illustration. But someone with a 65 Nova being told that they could get a 2010 Camry and saying, no, I want to keep the Nova. I suppose it's possible, but frankly it just didn't occur to me that somebody would want to do that. That's what he should have said. All right, finally on this, when the debate over what became the Affordable Care Act was going on, I was one of those people who opposed the bill because it was too weak, too favorable to the industry. It would leave too many people uninsured uh, even after it was fully enforced and actually wasn't about access to health care at all. It was about access to health insurance, which is not the same thing. Well, the response to that I got came in three types. One simply denied the shortcomings existed. Another was the shrug of, it's what will pass, as if the proper starting point for a political negotiation is the minimum you think you can get rather than the maximum you actually want. And the third was those who admitted the problem but insisted, this is a starting point, next year we'll come back to make it better. At the time, I told those folks, no you won't. You're going to spend all of your time and energy trying to keep what you've got from going away in the face of attacks from the right. To those people, I am going to take the opportunity to say, I told you so. Next time, listen. All right, now, for one of our regular weekly features, it's the Clown Award, given for meritorious stupidity. And this week, the Clown Award involves an example of what I call unintentional humor, which is when someone says or does something that they don't mean to be funny, they mean it to be serious, but you find it hilarious anyway. And I'm going to go do it right here because, again, it does in a way relate to what I've just been talking about so far today. The winner of the Big Red Nose this week goes to the author of a recent piece in the right-wing rag, The National Review. This author pronounced that President Obama does not have the legal authority for the health care decisions he made about letting people keep their substandard plans. The author called this another lawless act by the Obama administration and an example of the same unconstitutional claim to raw power which he has exercised in the past. The person in such high dudgeon about Obama's claims to raw power and lawless acts, the one so concerned with the Constitution, is this week's winner, the big red nose, that classic clown, John Yoo. Yes, that John Yoo, the man who authored the legal memos for the Bush gang, the one that argued that torture is actually torture, and that things like sleep deprivation and waterboarding are totally legal, and even if they're not, they are anyway. You know, it doesn't take a lot of brains to be a doofus.
but it actually does take a fair amount of intelligence to be as big a clown as John Yoo is. We are taking a break. Welcome back. Uh, not that you actually went anywhere, but uh, we're back. Uh, I'm going to start the second half of the show with a couple of updates about things I've talked about in the past. First is that back in the middle of October, I had an RIP for a man named Joe Bell. Uh, he was killed by a truck while walking on a highway in Colorado. He was in the midst of a cross-country walk in memory of his son, Jaden, who was 15 years old. His purpose was to raise awareness about the issue of the bullying suffered by lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, or LGBT youth, bullying of the sort that had actually driven Jaden to commit suicide. The update here is that a group of law enforcement officials and community members in Chicago came together to symbolically complete the leg of the walk Bell was on when he was killed. Beginning at the place where he was struck by the truck, the group walked 20 miles to Kit Carson, Colorado, the town which would have been Bell's next stop. What's more, at least some of those folks now plan to continue Bell's coast-to-coast -coast walk, carrying the message ab about bullying uh, and ultimately ending in New York City. Uh, our other update brings some happy news on a related front. Last week I told you that Hawaii was poised to become the 15th state to recognize same-sex marriage. Well, the update is that it happened. In fact, it happened on the day I was recording the show. Governor Neil Abercrombie signed the bill on November 13th, and couples can start getting married as soon as December 2nd. Hawaii has the distinction of being the state that sort of started the, the whole current debate about same-sex marriage. Back in 1993, the state Supreme Court in Hawaii ruled in, the, in a suit brought by two women that um, not allowing them to marry violated their, the equal protection of the laws. Uh, however, that court left it up to the state legislature to actually fix this, which the legislature never actually did. Instead, however, that Supreme Court case in Hawaii became part of the move for Congress to pass the grossly misnamed Defense of Marriage Act in 1996. Uh, part of that law was ruled unconstitutional earlier this year by the U.S. Supreme Court, as a result of which Gover Governor Abercrombie called a special session of the Hawaii legislature which resulted to this new law being passed and so things coming full circle back to Hawaii. Uh, and actually a, a quick footnote to both of those updates sort of as an indication of how far we have to go. The rainbow flag is accepted as a symbol of the movement for LGBT rights. Well, a new poll by public policy polling found that Americans, at least some Americans, are more offended by the rainbow flag than by the Confederate flag, even though the latter is connected to insurrection, racism, and slavery. And those who say it's just a symbol of regional pride are either liars or so grossly, profoundly ignorant of history as to render their opinions not worth hearing. Now, the actual questions were about if high school students should be allowed to wear uh, uh, to school Confederate flags or, quoting the question, gay pride flags. I should make clear those were two separate questions. Now, when asked if high school students should be allowed to wear a Confederate flag to school, a plurality of 43 to 37 said yes. When asked if high school students should be allowed to wear gay pride flags to school, the answer was a huge no, 57 to 28 no. When the question was posited as an either-or, the results, if anything, were worse. Only 9% said the rainbow flag was appropriate, compared to 38% being okay with the Confederate flag. Now, the one ameliorating factor here is that the particular group of people who were asked these questions were overwhelmingly right-wing. Fully 76% described themselves as somewhat or very conservative. So it's not a reflection of the general population of the United States. But it still means that there are people out there. They are out there in not insignificant numbers. People who would rather celebrate racism and bigotry than equality and human rights. We still have a ways to go. Okay, now for our other regular weekly feature, 
the outrage of the week. Ron Shapiro is a 37-year-old PhD uh, student at MIT. Became interested in learning how and why the FBI came to view animal rights activists as the nation's, quote, number one domestic terrorism threat, unquote. He's actually made this the topic of his PhD dissertation. Now, we ran into a wall when he first started, began using Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, request uh, to get significant numbers of documents from the FBI. Because to supply him the documents, the FBI demanded he provide case numbers, or file names, and names of the field offices where investigations were started which obviously was hard to come by that kind of specific information if you didn't have the information in the first place. And even when he had the information, the agency often claimed the relevant documents did not exist. So he began researching the FOIA itself, and he discovered something. Privacy waivers. Quoting an article about him from Mother Jones magazine, this is quoting the magazine, Suppose you and I volunteered for the animal rights group PETA, it's People for Ethical Treatment of Animals. If Shapiro requested all PETA-related FBI documents, he might get something back, but any references to us would be blacked out. If he requested documents related to us, he'd probably get nothing at all. But if he filed his PETA request along with privacy waivers signed by us, the FBI would be compelled to return all PETA documents that mention us with the relevant details uncensored. Now, because Shapiro had been active in the animal rights movement, he knew a lot of people who were still involved, and he started contacting those people and asking them for privacy waivers. The uh, first few requests he, he, uh, he engaged in using these waivers got back actually hundreds of pages of documents, including documents that the FBI had previously said did not exist. Using those documents, he determined who else he should ask for waivers. He got those, uh, and so on and so on. This was a novel and entirely legal approach. And the project grew. Until, that is, 2010, when the FBI simply stopped answering his requests. So in 2010, Shapiro sued the FBI, demanding it comply with the law. Here's where the outrage comes in. The Justice Department responded to his suit by asking the court for what's known as an open America stay. This is the delaying tactics under, uh, under which agencies get extended time to reply to requests for documents. Now, normally agencies have 20 days under the law to say if they'll comply with this, with this request. But under what are supposed to be extraordinary, uh, or technically, excuse me, exceptional circumstances, that's the actual legal quote, exceptional circumstances, such as when an agency is totally swamped with a request, that agency can convince the court to grant it more time. How much time? In Shapiro's case, the FBI wants seven years to determine if the documents can even be released. Because, they claim, release could irreparably damage national security by creating a mosaic of information that would have significant deleterious effects on the Bureau's efforts to investigate and combat domestic terrorism. Seven years. I think a so-called mosaic theory is based on the idea that a group of facts can tell you more than the facts individually can. That is, the idea that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And that theory has been used to block the release of specific documents, but it's never before been used on this scale. The FBI is arguing, in effect, that Shapiro's PhD dissertation is a threat to national security. What's more, the FBI claims it can't even discuss the case in open court, quote, without damaging the very national security law enforcement interest it is seeking to protect. Instead, it's filed a secret declaration with the court outlining its case, with only a heavily redacted version available to Shapiro and his attorneys, which means they now have to argue their case without even knowing what the government is arguing. A ruling in the government's favor in this case could potentially cripple the Freedom of Information Act and make it far more difficult for journalists, academics, and ordinary citizens to keep track of what government and government agencies are doing. In the words of Bahar Azmi, who is the legal director for the Center of Constitutional Rights, quote, under the FBI's theory, the greater the public demand for documents, the greater the need for secrecy. 
It's just another intensification of secrecy and control from an administration that came into office claiming it would be the most transparent one ever. As Shapiro said, I wish I could say I'm surprised, but I can't. Neither can I, but I can call it an outrage. Uh, Rulings expected in the case within the next few months. And finally for today, um, at least for this now, we're going to have another episode of our very occasional feature, Everything You Need to Know. Wherein, yes, everything you need to know about something can be summed up in no more than a couple of sentences and often less. In this case, the topic is Walmart and the increasing activism among its underpaid and overworked employees. Now, I'm going to talk more, at a considerably more length about this in the near future. But for the moment, courtesy of the Huffington Post, comes all you need to know about how Walmart pays its employees in one headline. Quoting, Walmart store holding Thanksgiving food drive for its own workers. And a happy birthday to you too. Now, that's going to be it for this week. Uh, next week, I'm going to uh, spend some time uh, on a couple of couple of important issues. One is uh, has to do with food stamps. Uh, I've been meaning to do this for a while. In fact, I've been meaning to do it all month, but I'm going to make sure I do it next week. The um, I told you uh, some months ago, like about August or maybe it was even July, that um, there was a cut coming in the food stamp program as of November 1st. There had been stimulus money put into the food stamp program with the idea that it would gradually run out as the uh, benefits for food stamps went up with inflation so that it would all smooth it. But in any event, it was a boost to the food stamp program uh, in the midst of our economic turmoil. Well, the Obama administration wanted to do something else with that money, so it borrowed some money from the stimulus for food stamps, promising we'll put it back. Then they did it a second time, promising we'll put it back. They never did. As a result, the the budget for food stamps was cut $5 billion as of November 1st. And what really gets me, this, this is entirely on the backs of the Obama administration and congressional Democrats. Totally, this cut is. While at the same time, they are screaming about the Republican plan to cut $40 billion over 10 years, which works out to $4 billion a year. They're screaming about Republicans wanting to cut $4 billion a year while they're cutting five. I'm sorry, that's just, I'm going to be talking about that more next week uh, and more about food stamps and the entire program and all the lies that are told about what is a remarkably successful program. The other thing I'm going to be talking about next week is the real story of the so-called first Thanksgiving, which wasn't the first and it wasn't a Thanksgiving. Uh, no matter from that, it's still a cool story. I'm going to be telling you about that, the historically accurate story. Uh, and it may actually surprise you to discover how little we actually factually know about that event. Anyway, that's it. I'm going to end up with our regular weekly reminder. As of November 29th, at least 10,702 Americans have been killed by guns in this country since Newtown. At least 93 of them in Massachusetts. Uh, You have a good Thanksgiving. If I don't see you before then, have the best week you possibly can. Peace.